Thomas Jefferson writes this. For the most part, writes most of it. Debated in Congress for about four days, three to four days. And then um, July 2nd, they declared their independence unofficially. And then on the 4th, right, July 4th, 1776, the committee approves the document, okay? And from that approval, it took some time to get everyone's signatures. But after that, right, we have seen this as our, I guess, not really a statement of faith, but a statement of declaration of independence, okay? Some ideas that we talked about, right, the government initiated by the consent, right? Those who are governed gives the government their consent to operate. And that's what the declaration at the very beginning was talking about. Uh, it, it's established for certain purposes. What was the declaration's purpose? What were some of the purposes that they laid out in the Declaration of Independence? What were some of the purposes? Okay, so, I mean, yes, they established that as their main purpose. It's kind of in the name. But the government's job, what did they say the role of the government was to do? Essentially, in short, the government's job is to protect the rights of the people. Their right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, okay? Along with the other unalienable rights, okay? And then they called out King George. We had a list of 20 plus charges against the king and his tyranny, tyrannical rule. And then again, they laid out the U.S. right to dissolve lands. Okay, not much longer, a few decades after this, right, we have the artist rendition of the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock writes the largest, what, why, why does he write it the largest? Did he just want to be go down in history as the guy that can write large? Did he? Hit? Yeah, look. Did it so the king could see it without? Yeah, it was a statement, right? He made a, a statement by writing it so large that the king wouldn't even have to put his glasses on to see it. Again, when they signed this document, it meant that they were committing treason. All right, we'll, we'll continue to go here. All right, uh, real quick. A uh, few leaders that helped along the way. Prussian general, right? Von Steuben. He trained troops at Valley Forge. So Valley Forge was not a battlefield. Okay, understand that. Don't get that confused with something that happened there. This was an encampment in Pennsylvania. Okay. They were camped out. It was a terrible winter. They had just lost, lost Philadelphia. Okay? And they're 20 miles outside of Philly. They're keeping their eye on the British that just took over their, one of their main cities. And winter takes place. It's a terrible winter, but uh, Baron von Steuben is going to train that army. And he's going to help boost morale. Uh, a Frenchman comes along, and he's kind of like the figuratively adopted son of George Washington. George Washington just said that he reminded he was reminded a lot of this, this guy in, in himself, okay? Other than he was French, he was wealthy, uh, he helped bring on more French allies, other people like Casimir Pulaski, uh, which has a memorial in D.C. He helped in the South, and Comte Rochambeau, again, another French general that helped uh, train and lead the troops, okay? So here are some of the memorials there in New England, the northern part of the colonies. Lafayette's statue of Baltimore, Pulaski there in D.C. Okay, even the Cafe Lafayette. Under Minutemen, New York, okay. So New York, New York, uh, and what we're gonna see is that the early part of the American Revolution Okay, note this. Okay, just understand this. Make a mental note. The early parts of the American Revolution takes place, if you look above Sydney, right, in this region, in the north. Okay, why? Well, in short, that's where most of the rebellion was happening. Why, why did they not have the issue in the south? 
Why was there not an issue mainly in the South? Who were mainly in the South? Loyalists were in the South. Right? People that were against the British were in the North. So British arrived in Manhattan July 12th. They brought their armies. They brought thousands of Hessian mercenaries, which they're part of Germany. Okay, 30,000. 30,000 against 17,000. The numbers aren't looking that great for the Americans. But nonetheless, they are fairly equipped. Now, why did they decide on the, the German mercenaries? What reasons? They weren't biased. Weren't biased, maybe. What issues do you think people back in Britain had? You think they really wanted to go war with their cousins? So they're like, hey, we don't want to send our people over there to fight. Let's hire them out to stop the rebellion. Okay? Uh, let's have a third party come in. Um, so with the numbers game, right, 32 to 17, Washington is forced to retreat. At this point in time, we have one of the America's first spies ever. This guy's cool. He was a, a school teacher and a spy for the Americans. Um, English teacher. His name was Nathan Hale. He was captured and hanged by the British. And he was so passionate about the Patriot cause that it said that in his death, he was to say, he had said, I only regret that I have one, but one life to lose for my country. Meaning, he's willing to die multiple times, right, and get caught multiple times. If he had to do it again, he would do it again, okay? That was Nathan Hale, first spy to be captured. So, again, a monument erected there for him in New York. Okay. All right, one of the most famous pictures in American antiquity, right, crossing the Delaware, December 25th, 1776. What's unique about this day? What is unique about this day? Christmas. It's Christmas. Who goes to war on a holiday? Well, the United yeah. States does. Okay? Right? They, they're, they have business. Okay? So he crosses the Delaware into New Jersey. He takes 2,400 men. They sail. It's very dark. It's cold. Right? He's leaving New Hampshire. He's making his way to New Jersey. He defeats the Hessians at Trenton the day after Christmas, okay? Killed 40 of them, and the rest are captured. But here's the kicker. No one died on the American side. So what we're starting to see here with this battle, right, is that there's gaining momentum, right? The people that may have been undecided is like, I don't think we're going to have a stand a chance, right? Just like the Miami Heat, <laughs> And no chance with the Lakers. <laughs> oh, uh, right? Uh, and then oh, all of a sudden, Miami won a game. And you're like, oh, snap. This might be a series. Right? And then they won another game. And it was a hard-fought game. And then ultimately, right, the Lakers just swept them. And uh, just wrecked them in that final game. Regardless, right, momentum is building. Right? The underdogs are gaining some momentum here. Right? Uh, and so the Battle of Princeton ensues after that, um, right, January 4th, 1776. Uh, but the, uh, so the British retreat in Washington stays in Morristown, New Jersey. Okay? Yes, sir? You said NH, okay. Yeah. All right, let's look here. Um, so a, more momentum is carrying, right? We've got to think about this as, right, a growing momentum. The war is growing in the north. And so what else do you do when you want to gain momentum? Okay? Well, you need a symbol. Right? You need a symbol that shows you that we are who we say we are. So the Continental Congress in Philadelphia adopted the Stars and Stripes as a national flag. Right? Every other nation out there has a flag. Right? It represents something about them. So who is Betsy Ross? Betsy Ross was known as the Little Rebel. Okay. Married three times, lost in the war. Yikes. She was an excommunicated Quaker, excommunicated Quaker, so she had, had some different different beliefs than maybe some of those other Quakers. Uh, she was a seamstress, so she was also like Washington's personal seamstress. And she helped create the iconic flag of freedom. Okay. Alright, let's look at New York now. So New York, again, this area, 
right here, left city. That's where most of the war is taking place. Okay. So the Albany strategy, right? What's their strategy? Let's capture Hudson River. Let's cut New England from the south. Okay, from a strategic standpoint, the British want to divide the colonies in half. Okay, why divide them in half? Well, in the south, there's very much a loyalist presence. In the north, there was not so much. But what we have is that we have these three British leaders, okay? Germain, Howe, and Burgoyne. And they're, they're here, they're living up the good life in, in the colonies. They're living in luxury, right? Lavishly living in Canada. Like, yeah, I mean, we're eventually going to just take out these Americans, so let's just not really worry about it. And that kind of ensues some of their uh, downfalls here, right? They didn't come up with a coordinated attack to take New York. So you have three different kind of personalities struggling to figure out what they want to do next. And one guy is just sitting in the mansion living the good life, okay? So those are the, the possible plans is that they're going to converge on Saratoga, okay? So you have these three big British armies uh, converge on Saratoga. But again, their communication wasn't great. Someone, some of these were lazy. They didn't do it fast enough. So this, make a note by this in your notes, right? This is important. Put a star by it. The Battle of Saratoga, this is a major point in the history of of American Revolution. It's the first major patriot victory. Okay? Yes, they're, they're, they're gaining momentum, but they they want a major victory here. So they, they stopped the plan. They stopped the British from dividing the colonies in two. They brought in the French alliance. So, again, the United States needed to be seen as a worthy adversary to the British, right? If you're not on board in joining this patriot ca cause, right, you're undecided, and then all of a sudden, right, you hear news that the patriots actually defeated this British army. Like, if you're, if you're an adversary to the British and you want to see their demise, you're like, hey, we can benefit from helping these patriots here. So the French buy in, right? The Spanish buy in. The enemies of the British are starting to buy in because they see this victory as they're, they're serious. They're not just rebelling, right? This is, this is a serious group of people, okay? Uh, and, and they're confident, and, and they're doing well. So this increased American confidence. Horatio Gates gets the praise for this victory, and almost so much that they almost out Washington as the commander of the, lead, uh, the Continental Army. That's how big this war, uh, this battle was, right? They almost made George Washington sit to the back seat of Horatio Gates. All right, Benedict Cumberbatch, <laughs> Cumberbatch. Uh, Benedict Arnold, okay, uh, he's known as one of the most infamous traitor, traitors of the American cause, right? He feels snub, right? He feels like he didn't get the credit that he deserved because he was he was much part of the success of the Horatio Gates as um, any other leader. So he's, he's not really in it for the American cause. He's in it for the glory, right? He wants to be known. He's in it for the notoriety. And so that causes him later to betray the Americans. And then the, the British are going to give him a position. So it's interesting. He, he switches to the losing team, right? If you think about it in baseball, right? Someone's switching in the seventh inning because they're maybe losing. And then there's this massive comeback, right? All right, so the British invade Pennsylvania in 1777. So General Howe's plan was to take Philly. Why Philly? Again, it's another hotbed for patriotism. Let's try to cut them off. So they defeat Washington and Brandywine. They defeat Lafayette and Germantown. And then they capture Philadelphia. Why else was this an important city? Well, this is where Congress met. This is where the Continental Congress, right, illegally, in, in the eyes of the British, met. And so to take the city where the Congress was meeting was very important. 
And so Washington, again, camps out in Valley Forge, 20 miles away, right? If we think of it, right, Gretna is a little bit further than where we're at in Bellevue, right? That's how close he kept an eye on the British. Um, Snoopy, right, he's just, right, the, the um, cartoon here, Snoopy is just saying, he's writing a letter home, he's at Valley Forge, he's on guard duty, and he's like, I finally found out my purpose here at Valley Forge, I'm guarding snow, because nothing was happening in Valley Forge. So again, Valley Forge was not a battle, but an encampment. 20 miles away from Philly, there was low morale, ill-supplied men, right? People were dying because of disease. A sixth of the men died of disease there. But they did get necessary training that they needed to do well. So uh, disease took out a, a sixth of their camp, typhus, dysentery, influenza. Yeah. Articles of Confederation. I want to stop here for a second. And, and highlight something. Put a mark by this, okay? In your note packet. Mark this up. This is important to American history. This is the first ever national constitution. Okay? A national constitution. And this is how it operated. Okay? And this is why it's different. Um, it created a national government. It got them through the war, so it was successful in that way. Okay? But it's different than the Constitution that we have today. Okay? This is the Articles of Confederation. So, a confederation is a loose association of states. Okay, if that's not on there, um, and just know that. It's a loose association of states. So I, I drew this up here on the, uh, on the board, and you can copy that if you like. But the primary influence or institution or government institution, right, that affected individual people in colonial time was this group. Right here, the state. Okay, under the Articles of Confederation, right, people still saw them as, I'm a New Yorker. I'm from Massachusetts. Okay, I'm from Georgia, right? The state is the central authority in the national government. Okay, it's the most important part. Okay, and this is how it works. Now, if they wanted to do something in this national government, these states gave power to the national government, right? The national government didn't take things from the state. The state was giving them the power to do things. However, here's the kicker, okay? Under the Article of Confederation, if you wanted to do something on a national level, the states had to have a unanimous decision to make a change. What does unanimous mean? Everyone. You think that's going to work out? No, they replaced the government very quickly. Okay? Right, by 1987, or 1787, there was a new government instituted. Right? And it was part of a federal system. Okay? So the state remained supreme... So, I, I give this example, right? If I said, hey class, I'm going to throw this class a lunch party. You guys are awesome, right? And you're like, man, you get really excited. And you're like, man, what are we going to have for lunch? That's the biggest question. And I throw out the idea that I'm going to bring in Raising Canes to cater. And everyone's on board. They're like, I love Raising Canes. And Will's like, I object. I'm a pizza guy through and through. None of this Cain's garbage, right? And so when it comes down to it, if we want to make the decision to benefit the whole, 
everyone votes for the Canes except for Will. Jerk. Anyway, Will votes for pizza, and guess what we don't have? We don't have a lunch party. Because there's not a unanimous decision. So you need to understand here, right, that the Articles of Confederation was a very weak government in terms of a national government. However, it did its job for the time that they were in. Okay? It, it did its job. And so what were the things that it did? Well, it created some stability in the United States. Right? It recognized that each state was unique. Unique New York, unique New York. Um, uh, yeah, as well as it supplied troops with weapons. It provided funds to pay those who were in the army. Right? And then it governed the colonies during war. What else did it do? It provided a means, right? When we came up with this Articles of Confederation, we created a government. Well, you only create a government if you're a nation. Correct? A nation has a government. So when we created this government, right, under the Articles of Confederation, we were telling the rest of the world that we, we are legit. Right? And we're too legit. We're too legit to quit. Right? Um, and so, again, it, people, other European countries started to recognize us. They're going to start sending aid our way. Right? And now, instead of solely trading with Great Britain, which, again, was something that many people objected to, it opened up possibilities to trade with other countries. Capiche? Okay. Orstown. Now, this one will uh, flow, up, uh, flow on to the next one as well. So, again, this was another encampment of the Continental Army, 30 miles south of New York City. It was one of the worst time periods in the 18th century in terms of the coldest winter. Over 20 snowstorms, which, again, we like our snow here in Nebraska only because it gets us out of school sometimes. Mm -hmm. But they keep 10,000 troops in over 1,000 cabins. And, again, this really harsh winter tested the morale of the people. Right, people didn't have enough food, so we start to see starvation happen. Right, when people aren't fed, right, you get hangry, and they didn't have Snickers back then. Right, so it tested their willpower, and even some people mutinied. So here's the Ford Mansion. This is where uh, many of those colonial leaders uh, would have stayed during uh, that winter. Uh, All right, take a look here, up here. Okay, so here's a visual of what happened in terms of battle. Uh, you can see that most of the American victories and successes took place there in New Jersey. Uh, Philadelphia, not so much, or Pennsylvania. Uh, again, Brandywine, uh, Germantown, unfortunate losses, right? Uh, New York. In the southern part of New York, that, those were British victories. And then they divided their victories there in the northern and, and central parts of New York. And again, Massachusetts was a toss-up between those two. How come there are only seven American victories and nine British? Because we didn't include every single one. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then when we look at the south, or the southern campaign, um, we see those Charleston, Savannah, um, Calpins, King Mountains, we'll, we'll get to those and explain those a little bit later. And then uh, Yorktown is the more important one. All right, uh, put a star by this person here. Okay? John Paul Jones. Okay? Pretty unique guy. So he came over uh, as a Scottish immigrant living the American dream. He was ultimately hired by Congress to lead their Navy. Okay? What do we know about their Navy at this time? Well, there wasn't one. Okay? Um, they didn't even have naval ships at all. 
So it's like they were at a severe disadvantage because they didn't even have battleships. So really what they did was they, I mean, they had a couple battleships, uh, some that they commandeered as well and took for their own. But what they, they ultimately did is they put cannons on merchant vessels and called it good. They're like, how about we just throw cannons on these uh, commercial vehicles? They're like, sounds good to me. There you go. Um, it's kind of a weird picture, but you get the idea. Um, so one of the more famous naval ships uh, that John Paul Jones commanded was the Bonham Richard. Okay, he he and his navy actually took the fight to the British. Okay, so again, our navy went from here. All the way to Great Britain, Isle of Great Britain, and attacked the British ports on their soil. Right? It was a war that we fought even over there. Um, and as his ship is sinking, literally sinking, in the English Channel, okay, his leadership is shown through. Right? Maybe he's crazy otherwise, right? Maybe he's crazy, maybe he's just very passionate. Right, his his ship is sinking, and he's like, "Bring it on!" I've yet to begin the fight. Yeah, my ship's going down, but I, I'm not dead. I'm gonna still go. All right, so the British need to change their strategy. What do they do? Well, they're not having any success up north, so let's focus on the south. There's loyalists in the south. Right? We can control the sea advantage in the south, or the ocean advantage. There's a sparser population. Okay, move around a little bit more easily. We already have troops in Florida. We have an advantage down there. We have some Indian assistance. So what happens? They take the fighting south to Savannah and Charleston, where the British conquer those, those cities. Patriots, very similarly to the French and Indian War, in the South, they used the guerrilla-style tactics against the Redcoats. So the Patriots are inflict inflicting damage on Cornwall's troops. They get victories at Kings Mountain in North Carolina and Cowpens. And they ultimately force them back to force Cornwallis and his troops back to Yorktown, okay? And then Yorktown here is something you want to, again, highlight, underline, star, whatever you do to focus on the importance. Okay. Uh, Yorktown, let me get there. Okay, so Yorktown, October 17, 1781. The Battle of Yorktown was the decisive victory that ended the war, okay? Lafayette keeps Cornwallis in Virginia. So they pretty much surround Virginia from... Uh, and so right, Cornwallis at Yorktown. He cannot escape. Right? Washington's coming from the north. So his land route away from these people are gone. The French, they have a strong navy. They send their vessels to help us out. And so we have this fleet of, you know, dozens of French... Ships that have converged to Virginia as well. They put Cornwallis under siege until he ultimately surrenders. And, and in that final stance, right, leads that Battle of Yorktown. So here's kind of the image surrounding of Yorktown. So Cornwallis can't really flee across, right, the, the bay over there. Okay? Because the French have blocked them. The British are trying to get there, right? If you look off to the right, those blue ships, the French are trying to help evacuate Cornwallis and his men, but the French are like, nah, you're not getting through. Okay? They surround Yorktown, they surround Cornwallis, and ultimately that was the deciding factor in the War of American Independence. Okay? 
Uh, tomorrow we'll look at the Treaty of Paris. Okay. Because I'm done talking. <laughs> okay.